thin and drag, and yet altogether sexually female. Margot was well liked on the set, but as time passed, her charisma couldn't compensate for her lack of acting experience. Also, the role was becoming more and more uncomfortable for her. Dino wanted a lot more sensationalism. The more we shot, the more he wanted uh, real graphic, juicy rape stuff and uh, sexy stuff. By now, millions of dollars were being spent promoting the film. Expectations were high, and so was the pressure. Let's just say that the pressures were, were heavier and bigger and more real than ever before in her life. I mean, she was really just scared to death. She couldn't read a script. I had never seen Margot like this. Errol would go off on business, and Margot and I were there, and she'd just order another bottle of champagne. Some people are built to handle pressure. Some people aren't. When we saw that smiling, fabulous face, I had no idea about the things that haunted her. In April of 76, the film premiered. People started to boo about halfway through. Um, because of the, uh, the vulgarity, I mean, the, the obscenities. And uh, people got up and walked out, but it wasn't Margot. It was um, dereliction of duty on all our parts. The film was an utter flop. The critics wrote scathing reviews, panning the movie, condemning the producers, and destroying Margot. Film critic Peter Travers recalls. Any model that tries to break into movies has to deal with people like me saying, Oh, she's a model. Oh, no, not another one. We're going to have another model act. Lipstick wasn't hack work. It had Anne Bancroft in it. Uh, so there were expectations. People went to this movie thinking, come on, kid, show me. I want to see what you can do. There wasn't any way for Margot Hemingway to live up to expectations like this, having absolutely no training. It's rare, even today, where you find models breaking in as big as Margot did, where she had to take the starring role in a movie. Because they're looking back and they see the lessons of what happened to people like Margot Hemingway. It's probably all our fault. Because <laughs> we fell in love with her. Right. And we wanted to use her. Not use her, but we wanted to photograph her. We wanted the best for her. They noticed the little one and not her. So that was tough to take. They noticed the little one all right. As bad as Margot's reviews were, Mariel's were glowing. Mariel stole the show. She could put herself into a child's let's pretend mode. I mean, she could sort of really get into a situation and get very stirred by it. The press anointed Mariel the hot new Hemingway du jour and inflated the sibling rivalry for years. Her relationship with her sister, which at that time was, I mean, an extremely healthy, loving, um, you know, very innocent relationship. And then all of a sudden, the press gets a hold of it and blows it into these ridiculous proportions. She ended up stealing the movie and deserved the acclaim, but I was upset because it was as if people were tired of me and gave her all the attention. You know, when you have this enormous rise to the top of fame and fortune and, and you know, everybody can't get enough of you, and then the next thing, you're going, hello, I'm over here. If we're talking about the press and that's what I do, I'm very aware that, you know, what's hot today is often cold tomorrow. And as much as I dislike the inhumanity of that, it, it's very much the nature of news. Find me something new, new, new. There was some vindication. Feminist groups actually applauded the film. An odd thing for flop to be, but nonetheless very influential in terms of other movies copying what that was about. The female Avenger became a major character in movies five or six years later. More significantly, the film influenced rape laws in California. A resolution was named in Margot's honor, and Judge Roy Carstairs presented her with a citizenship award. The entire business of, of rape and, and the uh, difficulty of, uh, of, uh, of uh, convicting the rapist and the difficulties of cross-examination that the victim undergoes was a very hot subject. We gave her the uh, award for bringing to public consciousness uh, what was an immediate, uh, really pressing problem. After Lipstick, Margot resumed her work for Fabergé. By now, perfume sales were skyrocketing. Thirteen million dollars the first year alone, and the line was expanded. After the film, uh, as far as we were concerned, it was business as usual. She was doing new commercials, new print ads for us. She was 
even more professional as a model. I think she was struggling to find the next step in her fame. And once you were on, you know, the babe, well, I, you know, what do you do after that? Margot did what she did best, played Margot. She ignited on the New York social scene, gracing every gala and adorning every club. I was on the fast track with every beautiful person you could shake a stick at. Everyone was lapping up my hemingway -ness. In April of 77, the beautiful people found their home with the opening of New York's legendary Studio 54. Socialite Nikki Haskell even produced a cable show there. You know, people used to say to me, uh, where do you live? And I'd say, well, I live in Studio 54, but I keep an apartment on 68th Street. The great thing about Studio 54, I, I think, was you had, you know, designers and artists and socialites and Wall Street businessmen all in one area dancing and partying and having a great time together. Former Studio 54 owner Ian Schrager. And that was just when this nightclub uh, era was beginning and there was an electricity in the air in New York City. So our idea was why not do a club that uh, catered to all people from all walks of life. And in the same way that you exercise discretion as to who you invite to your home in trying to make for a festive evening and a good party, we tried to exercise that same judgment and discretion uh, for allowing people to come into the club. The whole country was obsessed with what Studio 54 meant and how you got in and how the doorman let you in. And Margot was somebody everybody let in. The tall blonde goddess got right in, into the club and into the VIP rooms, which soon earned a notorious reputation for drugs and decadence. She had put our names on the list and we got, you know, right in. It was overwhelming how big it was. My first thought was, why would Margot want to be in an environment like this? We must have stayed there close to two and a half hours sort of taking it all in and waiting for Margot to show up. And um, I think someone finally told me that she was in a back room and she couldn't be disturbed. The society at that time was um, much more into a nightlife uh, partying uh, mode than they certainly are today. I never saw Margot take drugs, although I know at certain times she would show up, you know, less uh, coherent than others. but. Um, that wasn't unusual at that time, really. Uh, so that's why maybe the alarms didn't sound. Alarms didn't sound publicly, but they were reaching the highest decibels privately. I was in awe of that whole Halston, Liza Minnelli crowd. They were the real celebrities. I was just a girl from Idaho, so I drank to loosen up. In my grandfather's day, it was a virtue to drink a lot. It was a very small, very quiet, very shy, timid little girl inside of that big, gorgeous body. So it was hard for her, because she'd look in the mirror and see one thing, and inside she didn't feel what she saw. But the endless partying began to take its toll, and Margot and Errol's marriage fell apart. She had no boundaries. I've never seen anyone who could consume the amount of alcohol that she did. And Errol could not control her drinking. I mean, he tried to control her drinking and tried to get Jack involved. He tried to get everybody involved to, to assist. She just cut him right out. When we come back, they can charm the charm the boots off of your legs. Bernard was an unusual, charming man. And later, Bernard and myself, I mean. Basically, we were on the absolute outs. In the late 70s, Margot's disastrous screen debut in Lipstick, along with her insecurity in the fast lane, drove her deeper and deeper into drink. She divorced her husband, Errol Wetson, and became New York's favorite party girl, until she met Bernardo. Bernardo was something else. Bernardo is something else. I guess he's Venezuelan, but he came from a French ancestry. And uh, he, he knew how to live life. He really enjoyed it, and he was 
friendly, he was happy, he was outgoing, could be brooding and sensitive and uh, sexy. Very, yeah. That was her, her guy. Bernard Pouchet, Margot's new love, was a filmmaker, an artist, and like his predecessor, an entrepreneur, 16 years her senior. Bernard had also been married before and had children, but it didn't take Margot long to win the affection of his daughter, Talia Pouchet. I had a mixture of feelings at that time because my father was married three times before her. My father, for me, is my, my gold. She was so wonderful herself that it wasn't a problem for her to have the gold. She knew how, in a way, to take care of that gold. I had fallen in love with Bernard. He thrived on adventure. He could go into the middle of the jungle and survive. And that's exactly where they went, from the jungles to the mountaintops to the most romantic cities of the world, Margot and Bernard roamed the globe. Imagine being in the middle of the Amazon, you know, with the Janomamis painting your face and smelling all the earth and listening to the sounds of uh, the, the beings that are there. In 1978, their combined passion for travel and nature led them to produce an award-winning documentary about fly fishing featuring none other than Margot's dad, Jack. <laughs> By this time, Margot's babe contract had ended, and she needed a new source of income. She decided to venture back into Hollywood's rough waters to make another fish story, Killer Fish with Lee Majors and Karen Black. The reviews were tepid at best. Meanwhile, Sister Mario was on her own private fast track to the stars. Mariel just didn't go off and do another movie that was successful. She went off and did Manhattan for Woody Allen. And then to top all that off, and what an effect this must have had on Margot, Marielle gets an Academy Award nomination as Best Supporting Actress. Marielle was really fortunate that she followed that up with movies like Personal Best and Star 80. So she's working for Robert Town and Bob Fosse. This is Hollywood's creme de la creme. Margot Hemingway is still stuck doing things like killer fish. She's in hack Hollywood work. But at that time, Margot was preoccupied by her life with Bernard. On a snowy New Year's Eve in 1979, the two were wed in Ketchum. Shortly after the nuptials, the couple moved to Paris and Provence for a honeymoon that lasted nearly two years. Bernard had a... Um a wonderful uh, 13th century castle in, in Provence that they were, that they had been living in. And um, um, those were very romantic times. I, I don't think Margot, you know, drank as much. We went to the south of France, which was the first time I'd ever taken my camera crew and everybody. And we sort of trucked over to Europe for the Cannes Film Festival. And we went to this big, it was more than a mansion, it was a castle. And they had a big party in this castle, and Margot was there. I know that that's the first time that I had interviewed her. Thank you for coming on our show. Oh, it's uh, wonderful. Join us next week at this time. Okay. <laughs> Margot and Bernard. During this time, Margot and Bernard decided to produce a documentary film about Ernest Hemingway, revisiting his famous haunts. But their first challenge was to finance the project. So they met with investors Andrew and Jan Ippolito. It was April 1982 because I recall when we met Margot, it was raining and it was Paris in the rain. I liked her immediately. She has that type of personality that is very charismatic, I would say. Very friendly, very American. Bernard is, it was probably the, the typical European playboy. He can charm the, charm the boots off of your legs. Bernard was an unusual, charming man. I became fascinated by the, uh, by the project itself, Margot in search of Grandpapa, in search of Hemingway. I wanted to make the first truly good movie about Ernest Hemingway. I wanted the world to know that he wasn't just a macho man. Andrew Ippolito agreed to raise the money for the film, and Margot and Bernard returned to the States to assist in the effort. They came to live with me, and this is in Los Angeles. They came to live with me briefly, and then they got some money somehow. It was always this thing about money. With financial pressures bearing down on them, Margot decided to take parts in two more B films, Over the Brooklyn Bridge with Elliot Gould and the martial arts spoof, They Call Me Bruce. 
What's your plan this time, Rover? You know, I love you just before you get slapped. Finally, enough money had been raised to start production on the Ernest Hemingway documentary. We went in their offices once in Santa Monica while they were making it. They had a huge crew working. With people everywhere, stuff going on, but I don't know if any of it was organized. But organized or not, in the fall of 1983, the crew set out in search of Papa. And since Margot would be conducting interviews with her grandfather's prominent friend, she decided to take a crash course in his prose. She had a paperback of A Moving Feast, which is one of Hemingway's most distinguished books and writings. And uh, because of her dyslexia, Margot never got into it. She didn't know how famous her grandfather was. The crew started their European travel in Venice, where Margot's father, Jack, joined the party. Then they made their way to Paris. On the surface, it was quite a romantic journey, rich in culture and history. But below the surface, trouble was brewing. Yeah. This was a very social film where we were going places, and it does seem like it revolved around a lot of drinking, and possibly so. However, Margot did like to drink. She enjoyed it tremendously, and she had a great capacity for alcohol. But it didn't affect her. I, I wouldn't say that it did. None whatsoever. She was up early. She, was, she did what she was told to do. She was very congenial, very professional. But the team was shooting on an intense schedule, getting little sleep and spending lots of money. The pressures became overwhelming. We had all the media chasing us. Everyone knew that Hemingway was in town. Uh, television stations, newspapers, and articles began to appear in the paper. And uh, I accused Bernard of selling out. I accused him of, uh, of perhaps giving too much information to the paper because we really didn't want to have all these hanger-ons. We found ourselves with a not only our crew, but uh, more than 100, 150 people. Bernard and Margot were, were, were at that point in their relationship where it became awfully strained. There are different moments in life when you are strong and you can take anything from the media. If you don't feel well, you know, if you, you are in a transition that you're thinking about, you know, why you are here, it's hard to have the media also questioning you. The tension between the two of them permeated throughout the whole crew and it affected everybody because the two of them were at each other's throats uh, you know uh, it, it became very difficult for everyone to put on a, a happy face something must have been brewing before that as we traveled sometimes you get to know people in a different way culturally they were worlds apart he was an intellect an intellect who, who loved to read and write Margot loved to have fun <laughs> The fun came to a definitive end in Pamplona, Spain. The running of the Bulls Festival is an annual ritual which Hemingway popularized in his writing. For a week straight at sunrise, thousands try to outrun a pack of charging bulls. Then they party all day in triumph. Hemingway quotes and distinctly says that never take your wife to Pamplona. You may lose her to a better man. And in some ways, Margot was lost to a better man, to Ernest himself. Bernard and myself, I mean, basically, we were on the absolute outs. We were arguing. I was, I was with, this is not very, well. I don't know, I'm getting crazy. Uh, I mean, I don't understand that too much booze, too much fever, too much confusion. On their last day in Pamplona, Margot and Bernard were to film a dramatic bullfight. But Margot went alone. Margot had never seen a bullfight before. She didn't know how to conduct herself because the bullfighter dedicated the bull to Margot. By that time, Bernard was gone. And she cried. That scene in which she cries was when she saw the bull killed. For her, it was the killing of an animal not the skill of a bullfighter. Blood was coming from the bull's nose. He stumbled and died slowly. I was upset because it seemed like what was happening in my life. When we return... I never really knew at the time how bad her drinking problem was. 
but we would go out for lunch. I didn't realize that she would drink before we got to lunch. What were her priorities? You know, were they, was it champagne and, and limousines, or was it backpacking? During the early 80s, Margot met and married the love of her life, Bernard Fouché. The two embarked on an ambitious documentary about Ernest Hemingway, but the project failed, and so did the marriage. In the fall of 1984, after a painful breakup with Bernard, Margot returned to Idaho, seeking consolation from her family. But she met with mixed feelings instead. The kind of lives that you've that you've chosen uh, are tough on you. Because, I mean, I, I saw what effect fame had on, on, uh, on Papa, both in a positive and negative way. It seemed to me I heard it, you or Mary Ellen or both of you at some point said, don't worry, Daddy, I'll never change. But you do. Mario was off preparing for her upcoming marriage to Steve Christman, manager of New York's Hard Rock Cafe, and Margot's efforts to connect with her older sister, Muffet, who by now was married herself, were also unsuccessful. When are you going to play tennis with me? Yeah, I'll play any time. I want you to stay, and I play tennis with you every day. Yeah, so far it's been three days, and every morning it's like that. Well, I can't, well, you you can't, can't play. something. If you play at 9 o'clock in the morning, Margo, it's icy out there. You freeze to death. The ball won't even bounce. That winter, Margot decided to escape to the Austrian Alps for a holiday ski vacation. But the mountains got the better of her. She fell, cracked her pelvic bone and several vertebrae, and was rushed into emergency surgery. I remember she called me from the hospital in Switzerland. She said, oh, well, I, I, I missed a mogul, and I broke my, you know, and what was bad at that time is that she started really using, you know, the prescription drugs and the painkillers uh, and drinking in the hospital. And so she was constantly trying to anesthetize this pain and fill this hole up, this emptiness inside. For the next six weeks, Margot lay bedridden in a friend's London apartment, becoming more and more bloated with drink. Divorce procedures were underway with Bernard. And in her despair, her thoughts turned to her grandfather, and suicide. He loved right. I mean, if you can't drink anymore, if you can't, if you can't write in the in your best hand, which he obviously did. If you can't um, enjoy love anymore, the love of a woman, the love of um, um, the outdoors. I mean, I justify. Margot's fast lane lifestyle had finally landed her in a ditch. On top of all her personal pain, the IRS smacked her with a $900,000 bill for back taxes. Her only source of income was foreign films and commercials. Usted no reconoce. La tarjeta American Express. American Express, la tarjeta más respetada. Still determined to pull herself up and out of her hole, Margot moved back to New York. I was shocked. I'd never seen Margot, I mean, huge. I was so sad for her. I felt my heart, I'd never seen her this big before. I never really knew at the time how bad her drinking problem was. But we would go out for lunch. I didn't realize that she would drink before we got to lunch. I was on a merry-go-round of restaurants and wine lists, Bordeaux Reds and Bordeaux Whites. I would tell people that I was busy, but all I was doing was painting abstracts at home. You know, when you're Margot Hemingway, it, it's hard for her to retrench. She was already, she was, she was an icon. I mean, everybody knew her name throughout the world. The fact that she wasn't working was irrelevant. You know, I mean, you'd say Margot Hemingway, they would put her in the same category as Elizabeth Taylor and Sophia Loren and very famous, prominent women of our day. So she could not live up to her own identity. When you become famous and the world adores you, everything is thrown at you. I mean, and the whole world embraces you. And that hotness uh, is, is almost frightening. Very few people have handled it well. What were her priorities? You know, 
were they, was it champagne and, and limousines or was it backpacking in the mountains? But even as Margot struggled to find herself, she never lost the charisma that attracted new friends like Linda Livingston and Gigi Gaston. I met Margot at Millie Kaiserman's. She would go down to hear Millie sing and Millie would hand her the mic and she would sing along with Millie and rock the house. I met her with Millie, and she was singing. The way her voice would envelop you, her heart enveloped you. And she was a giver, and she was very, um, she was very lost when I met her. I think she was always hoping that around, around the next corner, her knight in shining armor would come and take her away from all of this. But then she's not the only woman that feels that way. And for a brief time, a bright knight did come along. His name was Stuart Sundland. He was a lawyer, a financier, and the son of the governor of Rhode Island. A friend of mine said, we're all going to have lunch in the Russian tea room. So it sounds like a nice idea. Margo was there. And uh, I looked at her, she looked at me, and we sat down and started uh, liking each other and had a glass of vodka. And had some oysters and sort of never looked back. I had my apartment, she had their, her apartment. But eventually, we sort of, you know, clothes began to move and then more clothes began to move and then you realize you don't have much left at the other place. So you end up living together. Stuart's a great guy. He was there when, when he came in, I think a year after I met Margo, during the hard times and he, he was so there for her. He really, really loved Margot. She was so down at that time. I mean, she needed someone to really help her get to that point where she could go into a detoxification program. She was just very toxic, and it, and it did affect the epilepsy, and, and she really was trying to push that under the rug. and. and thinking, well, I'll take this small dosage of phenobarbital every day, and, and it's going to control things. But it didn't control things. Margot's alcohol-related seizures became more frequent and more intense, until one frightful day, she nearly bit off her tongue. I decided that it had been a message to get well or I would die. I called the Betty Ford Center. My parents paid for the treatment. I checked in, and I spelled my name, Margot, G-O-T. Coming up next. Oh, you know, group therapy, and you're like on the hot seat and everything. And I started sweating inside, and going, you know, like an acting class or something yes. like this. And and I got really scared, and I went, I think that we have a lot to deal with here. The late '80s was the darkest period in Margot Hemingway's life. Depressed over her second divorce and financial woes, she drowned herself in drink until an alcohol-related seizure almost killed her. She decided to get help. In January 1988, 28 days after she checked in, Margot checked out of the Betty Ford Center, sober. She immediately launched an intensive health and fitness regimen, determined to shed her excess weight. It's a major psychological, physical change, and you know, it's uh, they have various sayings, Betty Ford, you know, change your place and change your players so you don't go back to the same old habits. So I think, that, you know, she really was very disciplined about her exercise and you know, she didn't drink at all. And Margot also launched another campaign, which she kept up for the rest of her life, confessing her sins and healing others. Margot preached the virtues of sobriety on the lecture circuit, in print articles, on the networks, tabloids, and talk shows, even the BBC. I wanted everything that they had to offer, the 12 steps and all this stuff, and, and it was very important to me to get this, because it was like, because before I went in there, it was like, it was either, okay, I can kill myself. Yeah. It seemed like a pretty good option, but there's one <laughs> idea, maybe I'll try life again. Okay? <laughs> Not only did Margot discuss her alcoholism, but she finally spoke openly about her ongoing battle with bulimia, impressing colleagues like model Kim Alexis. In our business, um, 
no one really says, how'd you get that thin? <laughs> do you throw up? Do you just starve yourself? What do you do? And I think that when she talked about it on these shows, she probably helped herself by helping these other people, by her talking about it and being able to get it out in the open. And producer Ronnie Stoller. She was willing, more so than anyone I'd ever seen, to expose the most vulnerable, most painful, and what could potentially